Section 2 of Reflections on the Revolution in France. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reflections on the Revolution in France, and on the proceedings in certain societies in London relative to that event. In a letter intended to have been sent to a gentleman in Paris, 1790. By Edmund Burke. Section 2. This doctrine is applied to the prince now on the British throne, either is nonsense and therefore neither true nor false, or it affirms a most unfounded, dangerous, illegal, and unconstitutional position. According to this spiritual doctor of politics, if his majesty does not owe his crown to the choice of his people, he is no lawful king. Now nothing can be more untrue than that the crown of this kingdom is so held by his majesty. Therefore, if you follow their rule, the king of Great Britain, who most certainly does not owe his high office to any form of popular election, is in no respect better than the rest of the gang of usurpers who reign, or rather rob, all over the face of this our miserable world, without any sort of right or title to the allegiance of their people. The policy of this general doctrine, so qualified, is evident enough. The propagators of this political gospel are in hopes their abstract principle, their principle that a popular choice is necessary to the legal existence of the sovereign magistracy, would be overlooked, whilst the king of Great Britain was not affected by it. In the meantime, the ears of their congregations would be gradually habituated to it, as if it were a first principle admitted without dispute. For the present, it would only operate as a theory, pickled in the preserving juices of pulpit eloquence, and laid by for future use. Condo et capono que mox de promere possim. By this policy, whilst our government is soothed with a reservation in its favor, to which it has no claim, the security which it has in common with all governments, so far as opinion is security, is taken away. Thus these politicians proceed whilst little notice is taken of their doctrines. But when they come to be examined upon the plain meaning of their words, and the direct tendency of their doctrines, then equivocations and slippery constructions come into play. When they say the king owes his crown to the choice of his people, and is therefore the only lawful sovereign in the world, they will perhaps tell us they mean to say no more than that some of the king's predecessors have been called to the throne by some sort of choice, and therefore he owes his crown to the choice of his people. Thus, by a miserable subterfuge, they hope to render their proposition safe by rendering it nugatory. They are welcome to the asylum they seek for their offense, since they take refuge in their folly. For if you admit this interpretation, how does their idea of election differ from our idea of inheritance? And how does the settlement of the crown in the Brunswick line, derived from James I, come to legalize our monarchy rather than that of any of the neighboring countries? At some time or other, to be sure, all the beginners of dynasties were chosen by those who called them to govern. There is ground enough for the opinion that all the kingdoms of Europe were, at a remote period, elective, with more or fewer limitations in the objects of choice. But whatever kings might have been here or elsewhere a thousand years ago, or in whatever manner the ruling dynasties of England or France may have begun, the king of Great Britain is, at this day, king by a fixed rule of succession, according to the laws of his country. And whilst the legal conditions of the compact of sovereignty are performed by him, as they are performed, he holds his crown in contempt of the choice of the Revolution Society who have not a single vote for a king amongst them, either individually or collectively. Though I make no doubt they would soon erect themselves into an electoral college if things were ripe to give effect to their claim. His Majesty's heirs and successors, each in his time and order, will come to the crown with the same contempt of their choice which His Majesty has succeeded to that he wears. Whatever may be the success of evasion in explaining away the gross error of fact, which supposes that his majesty, though he holds it in concurrence with the wishes, owes his crown to the choice of his people, yet nothing can evade their full explicit declaration 
concerning the principle of a right in the people to choose, which right is directly maintained and tenaciously adhered to. All the oblique insinuations concerning election bottom in this proposition and are referable to it. Lest the foundation of the king's exclusive legal title should pass for a mere rant of adulatory freedom, the political divine proceeds dogmatically to assert that by the principle of the revolution the people of England have acquired three fundamental rights, all which, with him, compose one system and lie together in one short sentence, namely that we have acquired a right one to choose our own governors two to cashier them for misconduct three to frame a government for ourselves this new and hitherto unheard of bill of rights though made in the name of the whole people belongs to those gentlemen and their faction only the body of the people of england have no share in it they utterly disclaim it they will resist the practical assertion of it with their lives and fortunes they are bound to do so by the laws of their country made at the time of that very revolution which is appealed to in favor of the fictitious rights claimed by the society which abuses its name these gentlemen of the old jewry in all their reasonings on the revolution of sixteen eighty eight have a revolution which happened in england about forty years before and the late french revolution so much before their eyes and in their hearts that they are constantly confounding all the three together it is necessary that we should separate what they confound we must recall their erring fancies to the acts of the revolution which we revere for the discovery of its true principles if the principles of the revolution of sixteen eighty eight are anywhere to be found it is in the statute called the declaration of right in that most wise sober and considerate declaration drawn up by great lawyers and great statesmen and not by warm and inexperienced enthusiasts not one word is said nor one suggestion made of a general right to choose our own governors to cashier them for misconduct and to form a government for ourselves this declaration of right the act of the first of william and mary session two chapter two is the cornerstone of our constitution as reinforced explained improved and in its fundamental principles for ever settled it is called an act for declaring the rights and liberties of the subject and for settling the succession of the crown you will observe that these rights and this succession are declared in one body and bound indissolubly together a few years after this period a second opportunity offered for asserting a right of election to the crown on the prospect of a total failure of issue from king william and from the princess afterwards queen anne the consideration of the settlement of the crown and of a further security for the liberties of the people again came before the legislature did they this second time make any provision for legalizing the crown on the spurious revolution principles of the old jewry no they followed the principles which prevailed in the declaration of right indicating with more precision the persons who were to inherit in the protestant line this act also incorporated by the same policy our liberties and an hereditary succession in the same act instead of a right to choose our own governors they declared that the succession in that line the protestant line drawn from james i was absolutely necessary for the peace quiet and security of the realm and that it was equally urgent on them to maintain a certainty in the succession thereof to which the subjects may safely have recourse for their protection both these acts in which are heard the unerring unambiguous oracles of revolution policy instead of countenancing the delusive gypsy predictions of a right to choose our governors proved to a demonstration how totally adverse the wisdom of the nation was from turning a case of necessity into a rule of law unquestionably there was at the revolution in the person of king william a small and a temporary deviation from the strict order of a regular hereditary succession but it is against all genuine principles of jurisprudence to draw a principle from a law made in a special case and regarding an individual person privilegium non transit in exemplum 
if ever there was a time favorable for establishing the principle that a king of popular choice was the only legal king without all doubt it was at the revolution its not being done at that time is a proof that the nation was of opinion it ought not to be done at any time there is no person so completely ignorant of our history as not to know that the majority in parliament of both parties were so little disposed to anything resembling that principle that at first they were determined to place the vacant crown not on the head of the prince of orange but on that of his wife mary daughter of king james the eldest born of the issue of that king which they acknowledged as undoubtedly his it would be to repeat a very trite story to recall to your memory all those circumstances which demonstrated that their accepting king william was not properly a choice but to all those who did not wish in effect to recall king james or to deluge their country in blood and again to bring their religion laws and liberties into the peril they had just escaped it was an act of necessity in the strictest moral sense in which necessity can be taken in the very act in which for a time and in a single case parliament departed from the strict order of inheritance in favor of a prince who though not next was however very near in the line of succession it is curious to observe how lord somers who drew the bill called the declaration of right has comported himself on that delicate occasion it is curious to observe with what address this temporary solution of continuity is kept from the eye whilst all that could be found in this act of necessity to countenance the idea of an hereditary succession is brought forward and fostered and made the most of by this great man and by the legislature who followed him quitting the dry imperative style of an act of parliament he makes the lords and commons fall to a pious legislative ejaculation and declare that they consider it as a marvellous providence and merciful goodness of god to this nation to preserve their said majesty's royal persons most happily to reign over us on the throne of their ancestors for which from the bottom of their hearts they returned their humblest thanks and praises the legislature plainly had in view the act of recognition of the first of queen elizabeth chapter third and of that of james the first chapter first both acts strongly declaratory of the inheritable nature of the crown and in many parts they follow with a nearly literal precision the words and even the form of thanksgiving which is found in these old declaratory statutes the two houses in the act of king william did not thank god that they had found a fair opportunity to assert a right to choose their own governors much less to make an election the only lawful title to the crown their having been in a condition to avoid the very appearance of it as much as possible was by them considered as a providential escape they threw a politic well-wrought veil over every circumstance tending to weaken the rights which in the meliorated order of succession they meant to perpetuate or which might furnish a precedent for any future departure from what they had then settled for ever accordingly that they might not relax the nerves of their monarchy and that they might preserve a close conformity to the practice of their ancestors as it appeared in the declaratory statutes of queen mary and queen elizabeth in the next clause they vest by recognition in their majesties all the legal prerogatives of the crown declaring that in them they are most fully rightfully and entirely invested incorporated united and annexed in the clause which follows for preventing questions by reason of any pretended titles to the crown they declare observing also in this the traditionary language along with the traditionary policy of the nation and repeating as from a rubric the language of the preceding acts of elizabeth and james that on the preserving a certainty in the succession thereof the unity peace and tranquillity of this nation doth under god wholly depend they knew that a doubtful title of succession would but too much resemble an election and that an election would be utterly destructive of the unity peace and tranquillity of this nation which they thought to be considerations of some moment to provide for these objects and therefore to exclude for ever the old jewry doctrine of a right to choose our own governors 
they follow with a clause containing a most solemn pledge taken from the preceding act of queen elizabeth as solemn a pledge as ever was or can be given in favor of an hereditary succession and as solemn a renunciation as could be made of the principles by this society imputed to them the lords spiritual and temporal and commons do in the name of all the people aforesaid most humbly and faithfully submit themselves their heirs and posterities for ever and do faithfully promise that they will stand to maintain and defend their said majesties and also the limitation of the crown herein specified and contained to the utmost of their powers etc etc so far is it from being true that we acquired a right by the revolution to elect our kings that if we had possessed it before the english nation did at that time most solemnly renounce and abdicate it for themselves and for all their posterity for ever these gentlemen may value themselves as much as they please on their whig principles but i never desire to be thought a better whig than lord somers or to understand the principles of the revolution better than those by whom it was brought about or to read in the declaration of right any mysteries unknown to those whose penetrating style has engraved in our ordinances and in our hearts the words and spirit of that immortal law it is true that aided with the powers derived from force and opportunity the nation was at that time in some sense free to take what course it pleased for filling the throne but only free to do so upon the same grounds on which they might have wholly abolished their monarchy and every other part of their constitution however they did not think such bold changes within their commission it is indeed difficult perhaps impossible to give limits to the mere abstract competence of the supreme power such as was exercised by parliament at that time but the limits of a moral competence subjecting even in powers more indisputably sovereign occasional will to permanent reason and to the steady maxims of faith justice and fixed fundamental policy are perfectly intelligible and perfectly binding upon those who exercise any authority under any name or under any title in the state the house of lords for instance is not morally competent to dissolve the house of commons no nor even to dissolve itself nor to abdicate if it would its portion in the legislature of the kingdom though a king may abdicate for his own person he cannot abdicate for the monarchy by as strong or by a stronger reason the house of commons cannot renounce its share of authority the engagement and pact of society which generally goes by the name of the constitution forbids such invasion and such surrender the constituent parts of a state are obliged to hold their public faith with each other and with all those who derive any serious interest under their engagements as much as the whole state is bound to keep its faith with separate communities otherwise competence and power would soon be confounded and no law be left but the will of a prevailing force on this principle the succession of the crown has always been what it now is an hereditary succession by law in the old line it was a succession by the common law in the new by the statute law operating on the principles of the common law not changing the substance but regulating the mode and describing the persons both these descriptions of law are of the same force and are derived from an equal authority emanating from the common agreement and original compact of the state communi sponsione republicae and as such are equally binding on king and people too as long as the terms are observed and they continue the same body politic it is far from impossible to reconcile if we do not suffer ourselves to be entangled in the mazes of metaphysic sophistry the use both of a fixed rule and an occasional deviation the sacredness of an hereditary principle of succession in our government with a power of change in its application in cases of extreme emergency even in that extremity if we take the measure of our rights by our exercise of them at the revolution the change is to be confined to the piquant portion only to the part which produced the necessary deviation and even then it is to be effected without a decomposition of the whole civil and political mass 
for the purpose of originating a new civil order out of the first elements of society. A state without the means of some change is without the means of its conservation. Without such means it might even risk the loss of that part of the constitution which it wished the most religiously to preserve. The two principles of conservation and correction operated strongly at the two critical periods of the Restoration and Revolution, when England found itself without a king. At both those periods the nation had lost the bond of union in their ancient edifice. They did not, however, dissolve the whole fabric. On the contrary, in both cases they regenerated the deficient part of the old constitution through the parts which were not impaired. They kept these old parts exactly as they were, that the part recovered might be suited to them. They acted by the ancient organized states in the shape of their old organization, and not by the organic moleculae of a disbanded people. At no time, perhaps, did the sovereign legislature manifest a more tender regard to that fundamental principle of British constitutional policy than at the time of the revolution, when it deviated from the direct line of hereditary succession. The crown was carried somewhat out of the line in which it had before moved, but the new line was derived from the same stock. It was still a line of hereditary descent, still an hereditary descent in the same blood, though an hereditary descent qualified with Protestantism. When the legislature altered the direction, but kept the principle, they showed that they held it inviolable. On this principle, the law of inheritance had admitted some amendment in the old time, and long before the era of the revolution. Some time after the conquest, great questions arose upon the legal principles of hereditary descent. It became a matter of doubt whether the heir per capita or the heir per sterpes was to succeed. But whether the heir per capita gave way when the heirdom per sterpes took place, or the Catholic heir when the Protestant was preferred, the inheritable principle survived with a sort of immortality through all transmigrations. Multosque per annos stat fortuna domus et avi numerantur avorum. This is the spirit of our Constitution, not only in its settled course, but in all its revolutions. Whoever came in, or however he came in, whether he obtained the crown by law or by force, the hereditary succession was either continued or adopted. The gentlemen of the Society for Revolutions see nothing in that of 1688 but the deviation from the Constitution, and they take the deviation from the principle for the principle. They have little regard to the obvious consequences of their doctrine, though they may see that it leaves positive authority in very few of the positive institutions of this country. When such an unwarrantable maxim is once established, that no throne is lawful but the elective, no one act of the princes who preceded this era of fictitious election can be valid. Do these theorists mean to imitate some of their predecessors who dragged the bodies of our ancient sovereigns out of the quiet of their tombs? Do they mean to attaint and disable backwards all the kings that have reigned before the revolution, and consequently to stain the throne of England with the blood of a continual usurpation? Do they mean to invalidate, annul, or to call into question, together with the titles of the whole line of our kings, that great body of our statute law, which passed under those whom they treat as usurpers, to annul laws of inestimable value to our liberties? of as great value, at least, as any which have passed at or since the period of the revolution? If kings who did not owe their crown to the choice of their people had no title to make laws, what will become of the statute de collagio no consendendo, of the petition of right, of the act of habeas corpus? Do these new doctors of the rights of men presume to assert that King James the Second, who came to the crown as next of blood, according to the rules of a then unqualified succession, was not to all intents and purposes a lawful king of England, before he had done any of those acts which were justly construed into an abdication of his crown? If he was not, much trouble in Parliament might have been saved at the period these gentlemen commemorate. But King James was a bad king with a good title and not a usurper. The princes who succeeded, according to the Act of Parliament, 
which settled the crown on the electress Sophia and on her descendants, being Protestants, came in as much by a title of inheritance as King James did. He came in according to the law as it stood at his accession to the crown, and the princes of the house of Brunswick came to the inheritance of the crown, not by election, but by the law as it stood at their several accessions of Protestant descent and inheritance, as I hope I have shown sufficiently. The law by which this royal family is specifically destined to the succession is the act of the twelfth and thirteenth of King William. The terms of this act bind us and our heirs and our posterity to them, their heirs and their posterity, being Protestants to the end of time, in the same words as the Declaration of Right had bound us to the heirs of King William and Queen Mary. It therefore secures both an hereditary crown and an hereditary allegiance. On what ground, except the constitutional policy of forming an establishment to secure that kind of succession, which is to preclude a choice of the people for ever, could the legislature have fastidiously rejected the fair and abundant choice which our country presented to them, and searched in strange lands for a foreign princess, from whose womb the line of our future rulers were to derive their title to govern millions of men through a series of ages? The Princess Sophia was named in the act of settlement of the twelfth and thirteenth of King William, for a stock and root of inheritance to our kings, and not for her merits as a temporary administratrix of a power which she might not, and in fact did not herself ever exercise. She was adopted for one reason, and for one only, because, says the act, the most excellent Princess Sophia, Electress and Duchess Dowager of Hanover, is daughter of the most excellent Princess Elizabeth, late Queen of Bohemia, daughter of our late Sovereign Lord, King James I, of happy memory, and is hereby declared to be the next in succession in the Protestant line, etc., etc. And the crown shall continue to the heirs of her body, being Protestants. This limitation was made by Parliament, that through the Princess Sophia, an inheritable line not only was to be continued in future, but, what they thought very material, that through her it was to be connected with the old stock of inheritance in King James I, in order that the monarchy might preserve an unbroken unity through all ages, and might be preserved, with safety to our religion, in the old approved mode by descent, in which, if our liberties had been once endangered, they had often, through all storms and struggles of prerogative and privilege, been preserved. They did well. No experience has taught us that in any other course or method than that of an hereditary crown, our liberties can be regularly perpetuated and preserved sacred as our hereditary right. An irregular convulsive movement may be necessary to throw off an irregular convulsive disease, but the course of succession is the healthy habit of the British Constitution. Was it that the legislature wanted at the act for the limitation of the crown in the Hanoverian line drawn through the female descendants of James I, a due sense of the inconveniences of having two or three, or possibly more, foreigners in succession to the British throne? No, they had a due sense of the evils which might happen from such foreign rule, and more than a due sense of them. But a more decisive proof cannot be given of the full conviction of the British nation that the principles of the revolution did not authorize them to elect kings at their pleasure, and without any attention to the ancient fundamental principles of our government, than their continuing to adopt a plan of hereditary Protestant succession in the old line, with all the dangers and all the inconveniences of its being a foreign line, full before their eyes, and operating with the utmost force upon their minds. End of section 2